Father, we just thank you, Lord, for your Holy Spirit. We thank you for the precious blood of Jesus. And every time we stand in your presence, we stand, Father God, by the blood of Jesus. What a wonderful power your blood has to cleanse us, to purchase, not just to remove sins, but to remove the nature of sin. And we know, Father, that in the Old Covenant, in the Old Testament, the blood has to be sprinkled seven times when it comes to sin and sin nature. We ask, O God, that even in Jesus, who is our sin offering, that you will cause the blood to be applied sevenfold into our lives. Purify, purchase, O Lord. Get to the very root and nature, O God, of all of our faults, iniquities, and failings. For you know our weaknesses, and you know where our flaws are. And Father, for some of them, we were born with them, O oh God, inherent, O oh God, in our DNA. For some of us, O oh Lord, we develop it through nurture, circumstances, trauma, and in, uh, all the things in our childhood, all the things in our teenage life, all the things in our adult life, all those who have developed habits of sin. And Father, we thank you that your precious blood is available for us. And we thank you, Father, that we stand cleansed, we stand washed and pure as white. Thank you, Father God. We thank you for all the power of your blood. And cause us to be conscious even right now of the righteousness, not our own righteousness, but the righteousness of Christ is imputed, imparted into each one of our lives. We thank you, Father, that Jesus has become sin that we might become the righteousness of God. 2 Corinthians 5.21 Let that be a reality in each one of our lives, Father God, in Jesus' name. And everyone say, Amen. Amen. Praise God. Give Jesus a good clap offering and you may be seated. Amen. <clears throat> Praise God. That's good. And uh, whatever we have done, we should be doing... Uh, at least consciously or subconsciously in our life, each time we worship God. Every Sunday, each time you pray. In fact, every day we are talking about the blood, how we need the blood of Jesus, not at the end of every day, not even at the end of every month, but 24 hours consciously uh, knowing that we need the precious blood of Jesus to be upon our lives. Praise God. And uh, so we have also been touching on uh, how we can move on with God, how we can continue to grow in God. And one of the promises that we always tell everyone is um, that uh, if you keep following and flowing through with, uh, with everything that we have done, in prayers and worship and teaching, uh, we promise you this, you will grow spiritually. And one of the things that a lot uh, taught me about uh, overcoming sin is that sin from his point of view is different from man's point of view. From man's point of view, we look at it with great condemnation. But from God's point of view, he look at it with great compassion. And he wants to help us rather than to destroy us. And uh, humans, you look at what humans do to sin. When someone breaks the law, what do we do? We shut them out. Or we put them to death. Uh, and we thought that's the solution to the problem. Because we are so limited. We forgot that when someone dies, they don't actually die. They continue living. And uh, so God cannot be just uh, doing that. Because then, then uh, there'll be accumulation. God has to actually uh, go to the root of sin and remove it. And uh, so God is uh, interested in that. And so from God's point of view, He views us with great compassion. Because He understands all our weaknesses, all our sinful nature. And not only does He understand, He sent Jesus Himself. Jesus who knew no sin to take all on the cross. And Jesus is like, uh, be able to absorb all our weaknesses and be able to cleanse us. Not only that, that is half the story. The other half is, He gives us His strength and His righteousness. God views sin, although He dislikes sin and uh, He hates all those things that are that, uh, against Him, mainly because they not only hurt the creation of God, the way God has made creation. They also hurt others. Whenever we sin, we not only hurt ourselves, someone, somewhere, someplace is hurt by our sin. And so it's, it's, uh, it's causing harm to His God's creation. And uh, when we constantly have habitual sin, 
from God's point of view, is because we haven't grown up. Surprisingly, from the spiritual point of view, although, remember, that doesn't remove the guilt or the penalty of sin. But from God's point of view, whenever we fall into sin, He look at it like we're little children, haven't grown up. Uh, he knows that one day we will grow up. Uh, we are like little children who sometimes love ice cream every day. If we get a chance, little children might eat ice cream morning, noon, and night. But they don't know that it's bad for them. And uh, so like little children, we love certain things. We, we love, and uh, not only that, uh, when we do something, we do to the extreme. We, uh, uh, when we have a love for sweets, you want sweets rather than normal food. And uh, so little children are that way. And God looks at all sin in that manner. And uh, some sins, as you come to God, straight away, remember, S-I-N-S, plural, all are washed away by the blood. But sin nature, the root and the cause of sin, for some of us, it instantly disappears. But some things are more deeply rooted and might take time. So don't get discouraged it's if you keep falling into the same sin. Say, what should I do if that happens? Each time you do, turn around, repent, ask God for cleanse you. And if you keep coming to God, after some time, you say, how many times should that happen? I don't know, in your life, maybe seven times, maybe 70 times, seven times per day, whatever it is. But if you keep coming to God, remember that what we're teaching, if you keep coming to God, some things will slowly change in your life. There's an impartation uh, into your life. And until you reach this point, until He changes your inner nature, say, what does He change in your inner nature? You see, we all sin because we love sin. It tastes good to us. And the reason why none of us will be in a bad habit if it, we don't take pleasure from it. I mean, if it's not something that you like, uh, let's say, when I grow up, I didn't like bitter cod, uh, the bitter cod vegetable. And uh, you got to kill me to eat it. And uh, so I don't like it. Now I like it. You know, as I learn, it's good for me, I develop a taste for it. But uh, when, when I'm small, I don't like that. And there's no way you're going to find me stealing bitter cods and eating it secretly. Because you don't like it. So we only... Uh, uh, take those things that gives us some sort of pleasure, whether the pleasure is temporarily or, or whatever area. It's because of the pleasure that we derive. And this is a miracle of God. <coughs> God works in our life so that that pleasure slowly goes off. Now, sometimes it instantly goes off. You just hate it. But sometimes in some area, because it's deeply rooted, we have developed what I call a false sense of pleasure in those things. And it takes time for the echoes of the pleasure to disappear. So Jesus has cleansed all your sins, but like it says, the body don't want to drink, but the mind is still there. <laughs> the pleasure. But this is my guarantee. This is the second part. Remember, sin had to, in the sin offering, you got to, you got to offer uh, seven times. You got to uh, uh, sprinkle seven times. Seven is always a number of completion. When a revelation is completed, it tells us there's sevenfold cleansing of sin. So the first cleansing, that's it. But as it cleanses deeper and deeper, the result is he takes the pleasure of sin from us. It doesn't come overnight, but it does. Turn to the book of Hebrews, just going to give that verse, and then I tie it to our message today. In the book of Hebrews, it says something about Jesus and um, why Jesus... Um, did not uh, sin and why Jesus uh, choose uh, to righteousness in chapter Hebrew chapter 1 verse 9 and look at what he says about Jesus you have loved righteousness and hated lawlessness therefore God has anointed you with the all of gladness more than your companions and to bring with the scripture what Pastor David has said in words. As the anointing increase in our life, there is an effect on the old nature. And uh, you look at this as an equation, or rather as a, as a uh, uh, sequence of events. 
From this one, it looks like you love righteousness. Jesus loved righteousness. He hates lawlessness. Therefore, God anoints him with all our gladness more than his companions. And notice it is, Jesus takes no more pleasure in lawlessness. He not only takes no pleasure, he hates it. It's not even neutral to him. He hates it. Now, if sin smells bad to you, you wouldn't want it. But if sin smells good to you, that's where the attraction is. And so somewhere our appetites have been changed because we have lived so long in sin. Our appetites have changed. There are things that, uh, that, that should... Uh, even nowadays, most of our appetites are upside down. Like uh, sweet, the, the sweet things stay sweet, but the sweet things are not necessarily good for us. And the bitter and the sour things, uh, that usually are the herbs and the veggies, uh, doesn't taste good to us. Uh, because our, our appetites have been changed in a fallen nature. Uh, but that can change with time. You can acquire new appetites. You can develop new uh, delights and pleasures in the right things and the good things. And so the secret in Christian life is not just to do it because you do it, but it's to learn to keep doing it as the best as you can, but to develop the appetites. Like if you love to pray, then no one has to tell you to pray. If you love to read the Bible, no one has to tell you to read the Bible. If you love righteousness, no one has to tell you to be righteous. See, the key is changing the appetites, the love and the area. And uh, uh, God slowly changed our appetites. Give Him time. Keep coming to Him. And your appetites will slowly disappear and replace with other appetites. That's how God slowly changed and transformed our, our lives until the things that you loved before, you no longer love them. Things that you never knew you loved, like prayer, reading the Bible, praying in tongues, spending, with God, spending time with God, eight hours a day, or fasting and prayer. And uh, say, wow, when the next time, fasting and prayer, yahoo, right? Praise the Lord. Say, your appetite has changed. Now you look forward to fasting. And before fasting, you say, ah, you know, and you look at it as uh, in that manner. So our appetites are slowly changing. And this is the thing about transformation. That's why the Bible says, uh, glory to glory. But here's the other key. It looks like Hebrews chapter 11, that the condition for the anointing and the greater anointing is that you love righteousness. That means you've got an appetite for righteousness. And you hate lawlessness and sin. And you develop and remove your appetites for sin in that area. It looks like a one-way equation. And this one results in the other one. But the reverse is also true. That is, the more the anointing comes into our life, it begins to dig up the, those things in your life. And it begins to expose those things in your life. And, and so don't run from the anointing. Don't run from the blood. Keep running to Him. And the reverse is also true. The anointing, begins to change your appetites too. The other way around also works. And uh, you say, is that true? It is happening. This verse refers to Jesus. Because all of us have fallen and were sinned. We didn't qualify there. It's Jesus who qualified. And this is Hebrews chapter 1. The end of Hebrews and the story of Hebrews is this. Jesus did that for us. And what did he do? Did he ask us the same condition? Did he tell us, oh, you must love righteousness and hate lawlessness before I give this to you? Never. Jesus did that for us. So we, we are the opposite. We receive from Jesus the anointing based on his righteousness, based on his work. And having received his righteousness and anointing, it reverses us back. We begin to love righteousness. We begin to hate lawlessness. Can you see the reverse? Jesus goes this way, we go the other way. And uh, so the key is to allow the righteousness of Jesus and the anointing of Jesus to change our appetites. And the more time we spend with God, the more time you spend with Jesus, and it's not you and I that overcome sin, it's Jesus in us. And then Jesus' appetites become ours. You say, can that happen? 
See, when someone uh, uh, has an amputa amputation nowadays or they have certain body parts, uh, they harvest uh, body parts from people who have died, donated parts, and then they put them, the new heart and the new hands or whatever, in their body parts. Uh, and uh, then that body part becomes a part of theirs. And it slowly changes, even though they keep taking the uh, anti-rejection drugs, uh, slowly the body begins to change. And we have heard there has been documented cases of people uh, who have a bone marrow transplant. And their blood type actually changed. That's remarkable. We are born with certain blood type. Their blood type actually changed. And, uh, now think about it in a spiritual way. Jesus implanted his seed into us. And that seed is growing. Jesus is the vine, we are the branches. When you accept Jesus into your life, in your spirit, straight away our spirit is born again. Then our soul, the root of Jesus grows within us. And Jesus continues to increase in our life until our appetites change. In other words, if you can use this illustration, our blood type change. Our blood type change to the blood type of Jesus. With the blood type change, our appetites change. We begin to grow. Which comes to this question. We really accept Jesus. Can Jesus still grow in us? Which brings us to our topic per se. Ephesians chapter 3. Take a long route and bring you right back to the topic. Ephesians 3, we are talking about the cute revelation part 2. And in talking about the cute revelation part 2, how to grow into uh, access all these revelations, six dimensional revelations of God in uh, Ephesians chapter 3, Paul prays for the Ephesians. The Ephesians, if you remember the book of Acts, they are one of the strongest church and the strongest Christian. Signs and wonders were demonstrated. Not only that, the Bible records that Paul spent two years teaching that church in the school of Tyrannus. All the while he had spent about a total of three years. Two of those years was every day he had Bible study in a school of Tyrannus. That's a long, long Bible study and a lot of things God has done. So these are very strong Christians and they understood the word, they understood the Bible and yet, Paul prayed for them like he would pray for a new believer. He prayed that Christ would be in their hearts. He said, wait, they accepted Christ in their heart, but still praying for Christ in their heart. See, even though Christ may be in you, how much he dwells in you is in terms of proportion. The question is not whether Christ is in our heart. The question is the proportion of Christ in our heart. And the greater proportion, then your appetites will change too. And this is our promise to you. That if you will continue to meditate on the word, grow in the word, grow in prayer, and uh, which is what I told Eddie when he first started joining, I said, Eddie, you just keep following, even though you cannot feel, cannot see, cannot touch, cannot blur, blur everywhere. Just following, it will transform you. And we can see his transformation, even physically. <laughs> <laughs> we praise God for that. And, uh, and uh, now he's sensing gifts of the Spirit and all those things. Because, uh, as I say, it is a growth. The problem with many Christians that struggle in the Christian life is they forgot this. Christian life is not a set of creed and do's and don'ts. That would be Old Testament style. Christian life basically is growth. You grow into those things. And uh, we need, as a church, to provide the atmosphere to nurture each one of us, which is a plan to grow in us. And so every pastor, every minister must be a skillful spiritual horticulturalist to grow the seeds that God has planted in each believer, to nurture it. And that's the key. So Christians don't need to str struggle. Of course, some young plants and some older plants and all different, different grades of plants. But we need to nurture. And that's why I want to encourage you. If you struggle with things in your life, remember, it's just growing into it. And the word grow already implies time process. Time and process. There's no overnight growth. And uh, we are not weeds. We are all vines. Branches of the vine. And uh, so it takes time to grow. Plus, 
the stronger the tree, the longer it takes time to grow. And sometimes it takes a long while. I think durian takes about five years. Nowadays, they shortcut bud grafting, right? And the very nature, the durian also now changing. Uh, somebody was just telling me, well, now I can eat durian, three, four, five durian, I don't feel heaty. And uh, that's because it's, uh, the durian has changed. Uh, but if you grow a durian from the seed, it might have be, be a bit different uh, in terms of that. So here, we are all like plants. And Ephesians chapter 3, Paul prays for the church in verse 14. It says, For this reason I bow my knees to the Father of our Lord Jesus Christ, from whom the whole family in heaven and earth is named, that He would grant you according to the riches of His glory, to be strengthened with might through His Spirit in the inner man, that Christ may dwell in your hearts. Say, wait a minute, Christ was already dwelling in their hearts if they are really born again. So Paul is praying for Christ to dwell in their hearts. He already dwells in their heart. So what is he praying for? He's pro- praying for Christ to dwell in their hearts in a greater proportion. See, as Christians, we didn't know there's such a thing. We thought you accept Christ once. Yes, you accept Christ once. But that Christ in you need to grow in proportion. And grow and dominate your emotions. Grow and dominate our thinking. Grow and dominate our appetites. And slowly, but steadily, our appetites change. And as our appetites change, when even if you try to go back to sin, you say, hey, taste different. Taste different. But for things to taste different, sometimes one needs to be skillful. So when I grow up, let's take the story of the uh, I don't like bitter cod. But now I do. And, the, and uh, so my mother used to cook the old Chinese style and you, you slice it in half, remove the inside seeds, and then you chop it quite thick pieces about probably, um, that would be 0.5 centimeter. And then you fry it, stir fry it, and then that's it. It's very bitter. Until one day, I met another person who was quite a good cook, and she was in a seminary. And, um, and so she cooked it differently. And uh, I believe it's her or it's another couple I met in Malaysia in their house. And they took bitter cod and they presented it differently. And so what they did was they sliced it very thin. And then they hot fry it in oil until it became crispy. Became like koropo. Uh, prawn cracker, for those of you who don't know what koropo means on the internet. <clears throat> and so she served it. So I said, what's this? She says, bitter cut in a different style. So she said, okay. I, I'm always adventurous. I like to try things. And so I said, try it. It was nice. It was like eating this koropo, which is slightly uh, bitter in taste. I had a whole bunch of it. And so I said, is there any more? <laughs> and so, because you know, David would say, cook me another three portions, right? <laughs> and uh, he, he loved it, he really loved it. And uh, so, and that's why I said, not bad. So after that, uh, I went back to, to my wife and said, hey, Let's try cooking bitter cod this style. <laughs> and we try a few styles. And after uh, a year or two of eating that style, I developed a taste for bitter cod. And then when they fry the normal style, I taste it. Hey, it's not bad. The bitterness is not good. Strange, isn't it? The whole key is presentation. So, so long ago, you always go to church, and the church always, you know, you're already a sinner outside. You come to church, the pastor slaps you with the Bible. Be good. Pray. You know, fast. And then we're already miserable. And then you, uh, you, you go back, going even more condemned. You know, you must do. You already feel bad in the church, and make you feel even more bad. And uh, the problem is, they never give a solution tell you to do each time as if you know so every time we go to church we just got nag so you could replace a pastor with a tape recorder nag 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 pray fast pray fast read bible pray fast read bible and we just know we have to do it and yet we don't have the power to do it which causes us to be even more condemned and uh, 
So in the end, there was no methodology, no coming alongside us, discipling. Discipling is coming alongside a person, seeing a person all the way through. And uh, so in the end, uh, we struggle. And that's why a lot of people are backslided. If we win all the backslided people in Singapore, your church will probably 100,000 or 200,000 strong. Don't even talk about getting someone born again. Because there are more backslider Christians than we realize. The more a society has been exposed to Christianity, a whole group of them are backslided because uh, they don't know how to continue in Christianity. The freshness of Christianity, and they found they just cannot meet the standards uh, that God wants. And the whole key is growth in God. And uh, oh, Jesus presents us the gospel in a different manner. Jesus did not condemn the woman at the well, but told the woman at the well to keep drinking from his fountain. And he expects that as she grows in him, she will slowly change. And the same manner, I mean, Pastor David has been with Shama for so long. Shama never, every time he drinks. <laughs> right, Shama will just... Yeah. The only time that I think Shama looked strictly at you was when he talked about fasting and prayer, the incident, you know. But otherwise, you never recorded, you know, Shama. <coughs> right? But, you know, so he's just waiting to grow out of it. And, uh, and in time, it's the more you grow, the more you want God, the more you desire, the more you're willing to give up. And the more you let go and then develop new appetites in God. So Paul here talked about growing in a sense. And he's praying not so much for Christ to dwell the first time in our heart, but the greater proportion of growth for Christ in us. And in this particular says, place, we tie it to the cube. And we talk about what is the cube for those of you who are hearing this for the first time. Uh, we are talking about a way to access God. And uh, uh, it might not appear to you as a cube. But the cube represents six dimensions in which you could access different planes. Uh, like when you pray into God, you could uh, access the area of the invisible realm. And uh, so in the invisible realm, uh, looking from your side, it will be you know, on the right plane uh, that you access the areas where whether it's God, uh, angels or the demons working in the natural, trying to do things in the natural, or the future plane, or things in the present, or heaven, and then or things in the Old Testament, or things in the New Testament, different aspects that we want to ac access. And last week we shared about how the six pieces of furniture tie up to this access of the cube. Now this is what we're going to teach this month. Next month we're going to teach about how it's through our spirit man that we access different dimensions. We don't teach it as a cube. But we teach about the power of your spirit man. Uh, it's also part of cute, but it's, it logically leads from this to that. Uh, like, I used to teach how your spirit man is not limited by space. It can travel and move. And we know that in the Bible, Paul said his spirit uh, can go and behold the order of the Colossians. And uh, Elisha says to Gehazi, when he went after Naaman, didn't my heart or my spirit go after you? So he know. So your spirit is not limited by geographical space. Your spirit is not limited by time. It could move into the past, it could move into the future, and it could, within the present of course, without uh, any hindrance. And uh, So your spirit man is also unlimited in resources and power. Your physical abilities may be limited, but your spirit man can tap on things that your natural man cannot. And so all these other qualities we will teach next month, they relate to the cube. But in the meanwhile, we talk about six dimensions of the cube and the way to access, we tie it to the six pieces of furniture in, uh, in the tabernacle of uh, Moses. And how we're going to tie it into the spirit man is remember, that the tabernacle of Moses also symbolized the tripartite man. We are spirit, soul, and body. And if you want a verse for that, 1 Thessalonians chapter 5, verse 23. Paul prayed that uh, they will be preserved, spirit, soul, and body. And that settles it. That the Christian view of man is a tripartite view, not a, du not a duality of soul and body, but spirit, soul, and body. And uh, in the tabernacle of Moses, we have the Holy of Holies, the Holy Place, and the Outer Court. The Holy of Holies represent our spirit man. The Holy Place represents our soul. The outer court represents our body. 
And each piece are related in how we relate to our spirit, soul and body. And all of us need to grow in the Lord. So that's how we relate. In the meantime, we look at uh, certain things that we need to, to understand as we, as we access these six dimensions of the revelations of God. And whether you see as a cube, you see as a circle, and uh, you see as a hexagon, or whatever else out here, you know, say, hey, how can people see a cube as a hexagon? Well, sometimes, you know, you might have double vision. <laughs> and that would be octagonal. And um, so, uh, and how you relate to it, uh, it is just think about it as six dimensions that you can access as you grow in God. And uh, the cube is actually, it looks like a cube in verse 18 that we may be able to comprehend with all the saints what is the width, length, depth, height. Now, that's a description of a cube. And um, to know the love of Christ which passes knowledge, that you may be filled with all the fullness of God. And now to him who is able to do exceedingly abundantly above all that we ask or think, according to the power that works or energizes in us. So here Paul, while talking about how Christ grows in proportion within our lives, is tied up to us accessing the cube. And the benefits of accessing the cube, which he described it as the love of God constructing uh, the whole cube. And for you, those of you who come today for the first time, uh, imagine this whole place to be a cube. And so the six dimensions is the dimension that uh, below us is like the present and, uh, or earth. Dimension above is like heaven, accessing things in heaven. The dimension on your right will be things in unseen. Uh, the dimension on your left will be things uh, to come. And uh, then the dimension in front will be the Old Testament. The dimension behind would be New Testament. And there you are in the six dimensions that you could access in God. And uh, we're interested in how to access this dimension. We already begin to see law number one. You can access it in proportion to the strength of your spirit man. It's, it's very clear uh, from plain reading. And it says here in uh, verse uh, uh, 17, that Christ, uh, verse 16 and 17, he prays that we will be strengthened with might through His Spirit in the inner man, that Christ may dwell in our lives even more, and that Christ will dwell in our lives even more, being rooted and grounded in love. Then we are able to comprehend with all the saints what is the width, length, depth, and height to know even more the love of Christ. So one thing leads to another. You see, in verse 16, the strength of our inner man. Well, verse 17, Christ dwelling in us. And uh, Christ's ability to dwell in us is proportional to our strength of inner man in verse 16. And Christ dwelling in us helps us in verse 18 to access the cube. Then verse 19, accessing the cube uh, uh, in verse 18, results in us knowing more the knowledge of God, being filled even more with the fullness of God and God's understanding. So one verse leads to another. So that's why law one is very obvious to us that uh, our spirit in man must be strong to access the cube. If our spirit in man is not strong at all and our spirit man is weak, then obviously you're not accessing the cube. You are sleeping in the cube, flat. Or maybe the cube is on top of you. And you go, where is the cube? I can't see the cube. What cube? Where? Which? Where? How? And uh, so there's no access. Your spirit man is just not at the stage when you can access anything. And uh, it's just like all things that are invented by man need electrical power or some sort of power or fuel to power it, whether it be engine with uh, fossil fuels or some things run with electricity. If you have a phone, a phone, most people have a phone, your phone needs to be recharged. There, some phones, some, I heard some people they invented phones that are solar power. Wow, imagine the next time they invent solar power phones. I never need to recharge anymore. Uh, who knows, the day will come. And in the meantime, they have invented solar phone charges, but you still need to charge. And uh, when your battery reaches a certain level, we call it flat. Your phone doesn't work anymore. It's below a certain voltage. But notice, voltage is not static. Voltage fluctuates. 
So as you keep, you notice you got the battery bar. It goes lower and lower and lower. And you reach under it's zero, flat. But even when it's flat, there's still enough voltage there. There's still voltage. And if you measure it by a sensitive volt, uh, voltmeter, uh, you will notice that it, there is still voltage. But it's just not enough to run your equipment. It has dropped below. And you need to be a certain voltage or certain current or ampere uh, in order to run the equipment. In the same way, our spirit man needs to offer a certain spiritual voltage or spiritual energy in order to catch the revelations that are flowing to us from all the various dimensions. Our spirit man needs to be strong. But the way it describes the strength of the spirit man in verse 17, uh, 16 is very specific. That our spirit man we strengthen with might. It is a play on two Greek words. There are four Greek words for power. Dunamis, exousia, kratos, and iskus. Here, it's talking about two different Greek words. Your spirit man be kratau with dunamis. We know that dunamis is the power of the Holy Spirit. And the word kratau is a word from the word kratos in its verb form. So it's kratos power with dunamis. In the Greek, it sounds like that. Uh, if I use the original uh, nouns, it would say that uh, Paul says he pray that God will grant you according to the riches of glory to be kratos with dunamis through his spirit in the inner man. So he said, wow, our inner man need kratos with dunamis. Dunamis is the power of the Holy Spirit. Our inner man needs food. It burns certain type of food. Jesus did say it in Matthew 4 verse 4. Man shall not live by bread alone, but by every word that proceeds out of the mouth of God. Just as your physical body needs to eat, your spirit man needs to eat. And we eat the word. The word is food to us. And uh, Kratos' power is accessed by the word. And the word can come in many forms. Just like there are many ways you could cook bitter cod. I could thin slice it and fry it like crackers. I could uh, chop it the normal size and stir fry it like a vegetable. I could take it and make it a soup. Uh, there's one more thing you could have done with it. No one has done it, but maybe one of you ladies might try one day. You could dry it in the sun, turn it into powder, mix it into cake, make bitter cod cake. <laughs> okay, or koi, or whatever it is. But there are more than one way you could cook something. And today, uh, Singaporeans, I mean, food is so important to you, which is why it's very important to use food as illustration. You can definitely relate to that. Uh, and, uh, there are many ways, and nowadays people uh, invent new and new ways of doing things. You know, long ago, when you have wonton noodle, it's just sauce, and noodle, and wonton, some char siu, some vegetable, and wonton soup. And then, of course, in Malaysia, they would mix it with tomato sauce or chili sauce, and it's red in color. And uh, then there are different types of noodle. But then, somewhere along the line, someone comes up with curry wonton noodle. So, then it becomes famous. And uh, who knows, one day they will use this wonton noodle and say, Spaghetti wonton noodle style. <laughs> and uh, so wonton noodle is spaghetti style. And so someone keeps imagining and imagining until they began to uh, create new formulas and uh, etc. And uh, wait until you have, you know, wonton noodle with durian curry. <laughs> hey, no one has cooked durian curry yet. I'm sure someone somewhere must have done it. Might be it didn't taste nice. Maybe wrong combination. You say, well, how can? But Here's the thing. Anyone who wants to love curries will notice this. When you throw pineapple into a curry, doesn't it make curry taste different? Or when you throw brinjals into curry, your curry actually has a different flavor. 
throw durian and say durian sin. <laughs> and see how it goes. And durian one time known the praise the Lord. <laughs> Some of you thought of it. And uh, especially durian lovers, you never know. And uh, it might taste good. And uh, maybe they use the wrong type of durian, those who fail. You know, maybe they should be like in, 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 in um, Thailand. You know what dessert they serve in Thailand? Green papaya. No, in Singapore and Malaysia, you will never drink, think, think of papaya as a dessert. Papaya for us is a fruit. Uh, pa- papaya is a meal, uh, not as a salad. Uh, well, I mean, it's a de- fruit, fruit dessert in the same, but we never thought of it as a vegetable dish. And because if you use ripe papaya, you can't even do it. So they use green papaya and they make it into salad. And many of you have tasted it, say, mmm, yummy, nice, but it needs the flavoring. Same way, who knows, they might think about green durians with unripe durians with the curry. Whew, now we are getting hot. And uh, then you get <laughs> hungry. And who would have thought of using banana flowers? Do you, if you haven't tasted curry with the banana flowers, mm, really nice. It's almost got the same taste as brinjal curry. Uh, it is a slight twang in the flavor that make it in what we use the word lemak. We all like the word lemak. Lemak, eh, for those of you in, in, in Western country, has to do with coconut. It's a coconut, creamy taste. Lemak is more like a creamy taste. And when you throw, it, throw in uh, uh, banana flowers, it makes a certain taste. And uh, I, have, I, I haven't found it in the hawker centers yet, so I've never tried it again. But my mother cooked it once. And uh, so she took an uh, uh, unripe banana. And the only way you can get uh, banana flowers is the flowers that haven't become bananas yet. So when my mother came and said, hey, why are we eating this banana? It's not ripe yet. And you have flowers. And she chopped it, cooked it in the curry, and it was really yummy. Mmm. Right. Now I can talk about it because fast over already. <laughs> so, there is a style of cooking. We need kratos energizing. The word needs to be presented into our body in many, many ways. And you could do it through a meditation on God's word, taking scriptures and personalizing it. And then you're reading. That's called the Haga meditation. Where Every day, we got it e- easy for you. God's meditation food one and two. And this is my guarantee to most people. You just keep reading it even if you don't understand it. Because you're not feeding your mind. You're feeding your spirit. When you're going to eat, you don't analyze the food. You just take the food. And so the same way when you keep reading it, something happens to you. It changes you. And that is meditation on the word. Or studying the word. Sometimes when you study the word, you're using your mind. And your mind is thinking through the word. It still relates to the word or some, in, in many areas. And then when you hear sermons online or you buy a message tape or read a book, those are the word in pre-packaged cook form. A sermon to me is like a, 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 a pastor who cooked his, his, his word and presented it nicely to you. So some present it very serious. Some present it, makes you laugh, 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 and then you get a word here and there. But you need a mixture. You cannot always laugh. Sometimes you need to cry also. And, uh, so you got all the different flavors of the word. So when you take a book or hear a sermon, the, the word has been pre-packaged or pre-digested in a way easy to assimilate. And so that can help us. But in the end, you've got to go back to the original. You've got to handle the Bible in yourself. And so, various ways that we have to handle the Word and let the Word come into our lives. What does the Word actually do? How does Kratos affect us? In the book of Hebrews chapter 4, verse 12. This is why in relating to entering the cube, the Word needs this effect into our life. There are many effects, but the main effect that it needs is found in Hebrews chapter 4, verse 9 to 12. There remains therefore a rest for the people of God. For he who has entered his rest has himself also ceased from his works, as God did from his. Let us therefore be diligent to enter that rest, lest anyone fall according to the same example of disobedience. For the word of God is living and powerful and sharper than any two-edged sword, piercing even to the division of soul and spirit, 
of joints and marrow and is a discerner of the thoughts and intents of the heart. So 9 to 12 speaks about a rest. You enter into a rest. And that has been pursued by many people, even business people try to enter into a rest. They can't sleep and all they have insomnia and all those things. And people want to rest because uh, all the inventions that we have give us more time. We fill our time even with more things to do. And uh, so out there in the, in the new age uh, world, they are trying various aspects of rest and trying to enter the various modes of meditation to enter the rest. And people want to enter a rest. Christianity has its own way of entering the rest. Just by constantly reading the Word and meditating under the Word, the Word itself is a sword. It pierces us and causes a deep inner rest to arise if there is sufficient Word. So you saturate yourself with the word. And I encourage you to, I challenge you actually, to test it out. And uh, uh, one time I read the Bible, uh, I, I used to read the Bible by, by chapters. So at one stage in my life, I read the Bible by books. So get in the morning, I must finish the whole book. And, and then that was just reading and studying. But then at one time I read it out loud. And so uh, I started in the book of Acts, chapter 1, which is 28 chapters. I read it out loud. By the time I read 28 chapters, it was about uh, two hours later. Uh, I must have read quite fast. And then, as I was reading out loud, just reading the stories, something took place inside. I could feel a warm sensation. What do you feel like? Luke 24, like the two disciples on the way to Emmaus, they felt a warming sensation. I felt like I'd eaten something. So some of us, we have not tasted what the spirit man felt like. You know, you could be hungry, and then you eat naturally, you feel satisfied. And so some of us don't know what that spiritual satisfaction is like. Because all you ever ate are trinkets. Let's say if you're very hungry, you have fasted for three days and three nights. And then uh, afterward, I just gave you a week sweet to eat. And you might say, okay, of course it has its thing. But you still feel, you don't feel that satisfaction in your stomach. And only when you've eaten a full meal, then you feel that nice satisfaction and you go, <laughs> and, and, and it, you just really eaten under your food. And so most of us haven't eaten spiritually. All the time it's a little bit here, a little bit there, trinkets, little sweets. We've never really eaten a whole spiritual meal. And I challenge you this. Sit down and read the entire meditation book right through book one. Book one is sufficient. And feel what it's like. Now that one is like, my meditation book is actually like, Maggie Me. How <laughs> package are you? Just easy for you. But after you handle the Maggie Me, you need to go to you know, uh, the other various uh, 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 things that try once, maybe take one day off or maybe on a weekend. Try reading out loud an entire book. Try Psalms. <laughs> 150 chapters. By the time you start in the morning, when you finish, it's lunchtime. And, but you will feel something. If you have never tried using the Bible as food, I don't mean literally using the Bible, so throw this into a curry, but spiritually reading it out loud. How that's how you convert into food. You read it out loud or you personalize uh, it and you're just speaking it out loud. And uh, there is a quality that, where it releases itself and you feel a real spiritual satisfaction, a kratos endowment. And uh, what does it feel like spiritually when you're full? What does a spiritual burp feel like? <laughs> spiritual burp is not as rude as a natural. <laughs> this natural body has all these roots, noises that come. But in the spiritual side, when you have eaten, there is a sense of peace and rest. It's like uh, your mind enters a stage where it's not worried so much. And uh, there is a, like an inner rest that comes to you. 
And uh, uh, David calls it in the book of Psalms that the word of God is sweeter than honey. So it's like a sweetness that goes through your system. And uh, you're satisfied uh, by God's word. And it's so important that in the Old Testament, God even tells them that this book of the law shall not depart out of their mouth. They shall constantly have it in their heart and in their mind all the time. They shall write them, put them as uh, frontlets between their eyes and then uh, on their hands and on the doorposts, everywhere to write the word of God. And God even orders that if a king should rise, the king must personally make a copy of the Pentateuch, handwritten. Make a personal copy. You cannot ask someone to do it. Make a personal copy and every day read it to keep himself in the right path. And so there's something to do with uh, maximizing uh, God's way in our life. It's called the Kratos power. How Kratos is related to the power of the word. The word began to prevail in itself. It's its own energy. It's like eating vitamins or eating good food, nutritious food. When you take energizing food, uh, you really feel the impact uh, and, and the difference uh, in your life. Uh, it really energizes you. That's what eating the word is, and your spirit man is strengthened. Uh, in chapter 3, verse 17, it says, When that happens, and your spirit man is strengthened, Christ can dwell in your heart, and you can be rooted and grounded in love. Now, what does it mean rooted and grounded? If I were to ask a simple question, what does it mean to be rooted? What does it mean to be grounded? And you give me your answers and say, then what's the difference between them? He must be talking about something. It's not just Christ dwelling in us, but something is taking. See, when we accepted Christ into our life, we welcome Jesus into our heart, there's a certain uh, Christ is in our heart. But it's not just Christ in our heart. Christ in our heart, and then it says we are rooted and grounded. Two verbs that are used. Rooted and grounded in love. Why? What does it mean? The original word root does speak about a tree roots. What does a tree root do? The tree root draws nutrition. It draws nutrition from the ground. Trees have roots not just for foundation. Trees have roots not just for stability. That's part of it. Trees have roots to draw nutrition. If the tree roots fail to draw nutrition, fail to access a place of nutrition, the whole tree will die. In Australia, during the drought, sometimes if you ever see the gum tree, um, in the gum tree, uh, if ever you visit Australia or here, if you see gum trees, gum trees have a very strange thing that uh, once in a while, you find one of its branches completely dry. And then that dry branch will drop off after some time, either broken by the wind or, or human being and break off and it dries off. So it dries off. It's just like some internal system chop it off. And the whole branch dries up and then it drops. And... Um, uh, because gum trees uh, uh, have the ability to exist in very harsh environments. That's why they're prevalent in Australia where there's a lot of uh, where water is very scarce. And, so, and then most of the time people don't plant gum trees in, with other trees because it's so hungry for water, it might take the water from another tree. And uh, you read the nature of gum trees. And... Um, um, uh, Eucalyptus will be the scientific word for the kind of trees. And uh, so the gum tree during the drought would keep on growing its roots until it finds a source of water. It has a great ability. But during the drought, you might see uh, 10 gum trees and then one gum tree suddenly dry out because it failed to find a place of water. And then after some time, the, the, when it, the whole thing dry up, then the government will come and chop down the whole tree and take it and cut it away. But you do see in drought, a whole entire tree dry up. 
completely. And we, we, we use it, live in Canberra, just across from us is a park. In fact, almost every place you got a park, across a, a park, and, and, and my dog used to run about in that park, and, and uh, there a few gum trees, and there's one directly in front, used to be a very big tree. Slowly, you can see it cut off its branches one by one until it's very scarce, few branches. Then at the end of the day, during the drought season, during the time the past years when it has drought, the whole tree dried up. It failed to draw nutrition. Roots are for that. The, that's the word rooted. It's to draw something out. And grounded is from the Greek word that talks about foundation. Now a foundation is for something else. A foundation is so that the building won't fall. And uh, when it talks about foundation, when they build tall buildings, they need a deep foundation so the building can withstand all kinds of forces and not fall. And so a foundation is built for a different reason. It's for a stability. And uh, that, st that stability is a different stability and they both relate to love. Rooted in love, grounded in love. What does it mean? Grounded in love is talking, now stability is challenged by natural forces, wind, typhoon, earthquakes, whatever, and the foundation is strong. It's able to withstand those uh, uh, forces that try to pull it down. And so being grounded in love means that your love is challenged from the environment. Now, there are two greatest commandments that Jesus has summarized. The entire human religion is summarized into two commandments. It doesn't matter whether a person is Hindu, uh, Muslim, or, 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 or Buddhist, or any new religion that come out. All humans just need these two laws in their religion. In fact, I talked to one Muslim one day, and I say, uh, you remove all our culture, remove all our how many times we pray, what we do, words and, and tradition, whether you burn candles, you kneel or whatever, remove all those things, wouldn't you agree that all religion need is just these two law? Love God, love your neighbor. He agreed. Talk to anyone in any religion. You know, why should religions quarrel with one another? When the fundamental thing about the religion is true good religion should have only these two laws. Love God, love your neighbor. But many people in religion forgot the two main law and they're so cooked up in, in, in the form of the religion. So you're not, your form is not like mine, so I will kill you. And so religious people quarrel because they forgot the roots of all religion. And same in Christianity, God tells us these are the two greatest law. Love God, love your neighbor. He told the Jews in Judaism and he brings it into Christianity. And you think about if, if all the religions in the world are to be removed and people started, you know, different things and all the religions, the only way all religions can unite is come under these two laws. Agree that everything all is just form and fashion of forms of religion. Only these two laws. Love God, love your neighbor. And these are the two laws that will establish all of uh, humankind. And of course, that is from us. The thing about the revelation of Jesus is this. It is not just us loving God and loving others. Christianity comes with this message. We find it hard to love God. We find it hard to love our neighbor. In our nature, we would be survival of the fittest and the weak get all slaughtered. And so, we find it difficult. And that is where it is not our love. In Ephesians chapter 3, verse 17, it is Christ in us and we are rooted and grounded not in our own love. How can it be when love is the ground? Love is the ground. So it's not our love. We are rooted into that love. We are grounded into that love. Which gives us these two abilities in love. We must be able to draw out that love and give out that love. That's the tree. To bear fruit. And... What does it feel like 
You know, all of us uh, have the aim. We want to be like Jesus. We want to be like God. What will we feel like when we have absolutely grown until we become like God? This is what you feel like. You feel absolute love for everyone. And you want to do what you can in that love to help and bless everyone. This is what that is like. And when we are rooted in love, the same love of Jesus comes into our life. We draw His love, and then His love flows to us to bring it out. So you notice, rooted in love is the love from Jesus coming into our lives and giving out to others. Grounded in love is when that love is challenged. There are things that make you don't want to love. There are things that make you say, you know, I don't want to do this. I don't want to be loving. I'd rather be horrible to this guy. I'd rather uh, judge this guy. I'd rather kick this guy. I'd rather punish this guy. I'd rather revenge on this guy. So all those things, the things that try to move you out of the position of love God, love your neighbor. And that is why it says it's not you and I. It's Jesus in our life. To allow the love of Jesus in our life to come out. And we are not asking you to love God. We are not asking you to let the Jesus in you, to love God through your eyes, through your hands, through your mind, through your thoughts, through your emotions. We are not asking you to love your neighbor. We are asking you to let Jesus in you love your neighbor through you. That is a different quality of love. And the two commandments stand in itself. But here comes the gospel and says, Jesus says, I am come that they might have life and have it more abundantly. And Jesus wants to love through each one of us and impart. And that is the ability that we need to be able to access the cube. Number one, you enter into a rest through the word. See, without the word, your spirit man cannot have Jesus dwelling in us. We need the spirit man to be strong for Jesus to dwell in us. And when our spirit man is strong, the stronger the spirit man. See, we're not asking. This is where Christianity has failed in its message many times. We tell people to do things. But how can you do things when your spirit man is weak? It's not just asking us to do things. It's telling us when your spirit man is strong, Christ can dwell in you and live through you. And the proportion in which Christ can live through us and flow through us is directly proportional to the strength of our spirit man. And as our spirit man is strengthened, Christ can be more and more himself and allow his love to saturate each one of us and to, to, to grow. And uh, that love, you know, not everybody wants the love of, uh, wants to be loved. Because by nature, we run from God's love. When God was looking for Adam in the garden, He says, Adam, Adam, where are you? It was probably the father calling out to her son. But Adam has run away. Because he feared God. He know he has broken the commandments. And instead of running to God, he's running away from God. That is why sometimes walking in pure love of Jesus can be uh, unsettling to people. And uh, uh, not every one of us respond to God's love in the same way, in a secure way. Because love disarms us. And uh, it's not our love, it's Jesus' love that we need to be rooted and grounded in. And uh, let me cross reference to Romans chapter 8, together with uh, 1 John, but let's read Romans 8 first. It says here, Verse 39. Uh, verse 37 to 89. Yet in all these things we are more than conquerors through him who loved us. For I am persuaded that neither death, nor life, nor angels, nor principalities, nor powers, nor things present, nor things to come. Do you notice is describing part of the cube? Nor things present, nor things to come. Nor height, nor depth. 
Not any other created thing shall be able to separate us from the love of God, which is in Christ Jesus our Lord. Which means that to access the cube, you number one need to be at rest. Number two, you need to be in the love of God. The more we are in the love of God, the more easy to access the six dimensions in God. And uh, it's not as easy as we put it. What is your motivation? What is your motivation in life? Most people will say success. Well, if your motivation is just success, even if you reach it, you will still be unhappy. It's just like buying something that you always wanted to buy and after you have it, the pleasure of, what, of having it is not as great as the one thing to buy it. Because once you have it. And our motivation in life should not just be for success. Should be that you want to be in a position of success which could mean for you more money, more uh, better job, a better position in life so that you can be an instrument of love to those around you. Now, when you add the motivation of love to your normal motivation, there is more energy that pushes you in that direction. Like for a person, a university student studying or a businessman going out to do his business, he may say, what's your aim? Oh, I want to get this project to make these millions of dollars. That is a goal, that's an aim. But when you, every time you pray, God, help me succeed. Help me succeed. Kong hi, kong hi. Make me fat choy. <laughs> so, angels and God look down and say, not enough. By the way, we don't celebrate Chinese New Year up there. I mean, they, what is kong hi fat choy? But then you say, kong hi, kong hi fat choy, so that I can be a blessing to this. You add loving others into that goal somewhere. So, you see, then God is asking you, why do you want these millions of dollars for? Oh, so they can buy five condos, 23 cars, <laughs> and then heaven, your prayer that goes up, chop, rejected, shoom, send down. <laughs> uh, but send back to you, say, uh, receive a test. <laughs> Until finally you pray, 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 and something changed. Now, you cannot just change it in your mouth without changing it in your real reality. So, until really you realize, why do I want all these things? And you say, okay, I want to help my whole family. You know, you could be the main breadwinner in the family. You really want to help. Which is why sometimes you see some of those who, who single breadwinner, that help the rest of the family, maybe they're orphans. There's a lot of grace on their life. You know why? Because their success is not for themselves is to love their own family or to help somebody else. And then when, when their goal is to help somebody else, somewhere along the line, uh, whether the goal is subconscious, sometimes the goal could be subconscious. And God can read your subconscious even before our conscious mind can read it. And uh, you look at some, uh, some of the richest men in the world today. Aren't they philanthropists? Many of those richest men in the world who are very, very greedy, miser, all die off. Only left those who are very generous. Why? Because somewhere God read in their DNA, when they are rich, they want to just distribute the money. They didn't want to be rich just to the sake of being rich. When you add love to your motivation in everything you do, why do you want ministry? Why do you want to sing? Why do you worship? Oh, so that everyone is saying, good singing, not good enough. So that when you sing, people are touched by God's love. Ah, that's something else. So that when you sing and you worship and, uh, and the love of God can be evident and people get comforted. People get blessed. People who are down here, your songs, they get lifted up. People who are about to commit suicide, then your song come. You know, there's a light shining somewhere and it's playing just a person just about to jump from the 20-story building. <laughs> and the song is coming up from one of the HDB who play too loud. <laughs> and they say, oh yeah, there's a light and then save their life. <laughs> and so, you add love to your goal. That's why a lot of prayers are not answered. Because we are inward. We look inward, the prayers are not answered. When you add love to your goal, then, and you keep that love in your goal to help people, 
to wanting to help people, to wanting to, uh, 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 to bless people, then the way you approach things are different. The way you approach things are different. Your, your motive, and of course God will know our motive. You can, you can lie, cheat, and, and try to say it with your lips, but your heart is not there. When, when really in reality, your motive really has the motive for helping people, suddenly you find a lot of energy flowing to move into the, and then all six dimensions are open for you to access even more because you're in line with God. Now the grounding part also is tested. Sometimes when you walk in love, the problem with love is when you love, you have opened your heart to also be hurt. The more you love, the more potential it is to be hurt. And the one that hurt you the most is usually the one that you love the most. People don't people who whom you don't love, they can say anything. But the people whom you love the most, one tiny word from them hurts you. Ah! And like Romeo, you die. You drink the poison and die. Or is it Juliet, whoever? You know? Romeo thought Juliet died, so Romeo drank poison or something and died. And it hurts you even more. While the noise from all the error doesn't hurt, but the one you love, whom you actually love. So the problem with loving people is you make yourself vulnerable. And it's easy to give up on loving. That is where God's love is unconditional. That's where we learn the grounding. That's why it's not easy. Rooted and grounded in love. Talk. One word read so easy, but practical life. Grounded in love means the wind blow at you. Against love, you still blow back in love. The earthquake shake you from love, you still maintain your position to love. You will choose to love. No matter how bad circumstances are, how much smart people throw at you, you still choose to love. Every Christian goes through that. And if you're a true minister of God, you will have your share of persecution. And, uh, and true enough, I mean, Pastor David has been persecuted, so have I, we've been persecuted. And you know the people who make our lives miserable are not non-Christians. Not non-Christians. They're Christians who thought probably that he's false prophet. You know, and talk I'm off, off somewhere. But it's Christians who good intention, probably. But, you know, they are not expressing themselves correctly. And in the flesh, you know, maybe you more than I feel like pounding them, boom, because you're a soldier. In my father, you got an M16 gun. <laughs> all of them, mow them down with some, some, some machine gun. And that's the end of all your trouble. <laughs> but the reaction is always, sometimes you're crying. My wife has seen me many times cry. Every hurt that people do, it's not that I'm emotional. You cry, you weep. And then at the end, I say, I still choose to love. I will not let unforgiveness or anger and hatred come. I will react like Jesus on the cross. Now, at first, your first reaction might be in a flash. But you hold yourself and then you choose to love. And it always starts with you declaring before God. Saying, God, my own love is not enough. I need a greater supply of your love. Then the roots draw out more love. And you choose to love and the love push back. So that at the end of the day, you can say this, you've got no unforgiveness in your life. Every hurt that everyone has done to you, whether it be your own family, it be your loved ones, or some of you have gone through broken marriages, or some of you have gone through uh, various uh, areas where your own siblings might be giving problems, or, or various things of your work life, or your boss, or your employees, or whatever, They've done things to you, but you choose to react only in love then you have won. You're qualified for the cube accessing. And in verse 18, that we may be able to comprehend with all the saints. The word comprehend is from the Greek word katalambano. Any Greek student will tell you who learns uh, Greek, one of the first words they learn in learning New Testament Greek is the word uh, lambano. Lambano is actually to take or to receive. To take or receive. So it's this direction, not the other direction giving. To give is another word. And uh, here is to receive. And uh, so the word comprehend 
kata lambano means to uh, to receive upon based upon something and uh, according to according to the love of God in your life and so the translation could read this that we may be able to receive together with all the saints what is the wavelength that breath of the love of God so it's the ability to receive as we establish in love, the same ability to love causes you to have the great ability to receive. To receive more from God. To receive all that God wants to do in your life, in God. And, uh, and that's uh, what God will bring you into, plus also in the area of uh, uh, things beyond us in verse 19 and 20. Even things beyond what you ask or think, according to the energizing that rises within you. And so I want to summarize this aspect of the cube which relates to the spirit man and relates to love and our excess. And uh, our desire must be pure and our love for God must be pure. And uh, so the, uh, in summary, in terms of all this, the law of the spirit, uh, the strength of our spirit man, we must be rooted and grounded in the love of God. And uh, then we are unable to be uh, in verse 18, to receive all the blessings from the cube, I will rewrite it in a summary in a different points of inclination. Let's suppose that if every one of us to go to heaven right now, the main transportation of heaven, how do you move from one place to another? I haven't thought of that. <laughs> See, I go to heaven, no, you're not going to tell me how to move. <laughs> no, of course, you know, you can walk, of course. But walking is very slow because there are many places to go. So how do we actually move in heaven? By the power of thoughts. And that is why some people gravitate to heaven, some people gravitate to hell. Depending on where you are right now, that there is a, a focus in your life. What are you thinking most in your life? So your, your greatest thoughts in you should be your passion and your love. And we move based on uh, our inclination and our thoughts. Let's say in heaven, you're thinking about Jesus and, uh, and as you focus on Jesus and your desire is towards Jesus, you will gravitate to Jesus. The thought energy draws you unto Jesus. And uh, that's, that's uh, an area that flows. Your whole spirit being is moved by your inclination and your thoughts. In the same way, assessing the cube, I will put the words as... Uh, after being energized by the word, your inclination. So I quickly conclude by showing here uh, various people's excess. In the book of Genesis, in Genesis chapter 40, let's say it's 40, 41, Joseph and Pharaoh, chapter 40. Pharaoh had a dream in the way Pharaoh accessed the uh, left panel, things to come. So in a dream, uh, chapter 40, there you have the, the dreams of the chief butler and the baker. Then in chapter 41, it came to pass at the end of two full years, Pharaoh had a dream. Behold, he stood by the river and he saw the seven fat cows followed by the 17 cows. No one could interpret the second dream in verse 5. He slapped and dreamt again. Seven heads of grain and then 17 heads of grain. No one could interpret but Joseph. And then in verse 28, Joseph will interpret the dream says here <clears throat> that uh, this is the thing in verse 28, chapter 41, verse 28. This is the thing which I have spoken to Pharaoh. God has shown Pharaoh what he is about to do. So Pharaoh, for some reason, because his head there, he might have been a, a, a good man reasonably, and uh, angels of God might work with good people, uh, Christians and non-Christians. So apparently, a terrible thing is going to happen that will affect many, many millions of lives. And so Pharaoh, in a dream, was assessing the light panel, the cube, things to come. Now let's look, at, and it protect many lives through Joseph, of course, uh, who was involved. We look also here at the book of Daniel. In the book of Daniel, we see King Nebuchadnezzar. And here, King Nebuchadnezzar had a dream which nobody could interpret. Now, what we're interested in, not just the dream. 
we're interested in how the dream came about. In chapter 2, verse 1, it says, Nebuchadnezzar had dreams, his spirit was so troubled, and his sleep left him. He asked for his interpretation, but no one could tell. In verse 3, his spirit was anxious, he knew it was an important dream, significant dream. And um, in the end, when Daniel had the interpretation of dream, Daniel said this to the king. Uh, in that same chapter, chapter 2, and as Daniel stood before the king, he says in verse 29, As for you, O king, thoughts came to your mind while on your bed about what would come to pass after this. He who reveals secrets has made known to you what will be. Now, verse 29 says, King, when you were about to sleep, the thoughts came to your mind what will happen after your kingdom. When you slept with your inclination and desire in a certain direction, the king, in God's mercy, was stepping on the left plane of the cute things to come, and he saw a dream of things to come. I call that inclination. He was drawn into the area. So in assessing the cube, besides knowing that our spirit man must be strong, we must root and ground in love, we're talking about how to control the inclination. That is, your desire and inclination. What are your inclinations? That is the area that you will be drawn into the cube. And if you desire certain things of the things to come, you see, most of us, we only think of the present. That's why you sleep a hundred sleeps and you got up. Some of you don't remember your dream. Now, every one of us dream. We all have REM movement, which is rapid eye movement. And rapid eye movement scientifically means you're dreaming. Except you don't remember your dream. Maybe the dreams are not important. But most of us are so concerned about our present life. And remember which plane was a present? The one underneath. So you never access any other plane. Why? No interest. Your heart's desire is like a, like, like a big gravitational block that is on the earth. Pull down. <laughs> so you sleep, you're only looking down there. You wake, you're looking down there. Walking, also looking down there. Of course, you cannot access all the other planes. In your heart, in your life, they don't exist. Only when you start thinking about heavenly things, life to come. What will happen to me at the age of 90? And then you're thinking so hard until you occupy 24 hours. Then that night when you sleep, you access things to come because it concerns you. And... So, there's an inclination that draws you into the cube. Where is your heart? Where is your mind? That will affect you. And then, the other thing is uh, chapter 3, verse uh, uh, 16, Kratos. Which part of the word that you have been affecting your life? See, the word is multifaceted. Which is why, if you are meditating and you have been doing a lot of New Testament reading, and then you sleep with this kratos upon you, energizing you on Jesus and the disciples, you may be drawn towards the area. And uh, so it depending on which part of the word is affecting most in your life. If right now, the only parts of the word that are important to you is prosperity and success. And you're meditating all on those things. And of course, anything that you access in a cube will be limited by the window that you have opened. Only things to do in the area of excess. So where the kratos is in your life, what area of kratos you meditate affect where you are in the cube. And the reason why I set the cube, I set the cube heavenly area because I'm interested in heaven. I'm interested in what happened when we die, what happened, what we do in heaven. And so those interests uh, come to you. If you're like King Nebuchadnezzar, thinking what will happen, things to come, then you might access the other side. Or if you are uh, wondering, you know, where am I spiritually? What is spiritual warfare like? You slept with that, or you're inside, and you're praying inside, you will be drawn into the area. In a sense, although we can access, yet we are powerless in the sense that because of our very nature, you're attracted to certain planes, or you're not attracted at all. And the Holy Spirit can only work to you in the, as in, in the sense of your inclination. So the final thing is your inclination. Your inclination is affected by your final thoughts and that occupy your life in your heart. Your access of 
how much of God's word, which part of God's word is affecting your life. And uh, finally, love is still the key. Love uh, is the beginning and the end. And only in the atmosphere of love, what is God's love like? It's forgiveness, it's pure. If you're not, God's love is not inside cleaning you and your heart is not filled with God. So let's say your heart filled with anger. You cannot access. You cannot access at all. The anger stops you accessing various parts of the cube. Or your heart has unforgiveness. Something in your heart from your past or your present, maybe something people have done to you. The unforgiveness is in your heart. You won't let it go. You won't let God's love come and touch you. Your access to the cube straight away is limited. In fact, as far as you're concerned, it doesn't exist. It could exist within the sixth dimension, but it doesn't exist to you. Because you're too engrossed in certain things. And it's outside of love. Love needs to flow freely. And the rest point is love. And in that love, you can flow in all the dimensions of God. And that's where the cube becomes accessible. Let's go to God in prayer. Father, we thank you for your revelations on accessing all these dimensions. We thank you, Father God, that you're working in each area of our heart and our life. We know that your word says that the Holy Spirit will show us things to come. And we ask, O oh God, that you will cleanse our heart and our mind, remove all the fears from our life. For the fears within our heart prevent us, O oh Father, from assessing the things that you see. To see clearly is to let your eyes see and not just our eyes. So we want to see through your eyes and not through our own eyes, O oh Father. We ask, O oh God, that even as you establish all these things in our life, teach us to grow in our spirit. Thank you for your word. Thank you for your spirit. And cause us, Lord, to grow in wisdom and knowledge in all these aspects of the spiritual dimension. Most of all, we learn to grow in your love. For love is the key, the beginning and the end. Thank you, Father, in Jesus' name. Praise God. Let's all rise together and let's sing the song. Uh, Jesus says a new commandment that we have to love one another as He loves us. A new commandment I gave unto you that you love one another as I have loved you that you love one another as I have loved you by day That you are my disciples If you have love One for another By day shall a man know That you are my disciples if you have love one for another even as we come to god in prayer examine our hearts and our mind the root of all sin comes from breaking away from the love of god whether it be anger or disproportionate area of love like lust falling into certain fleshly areas. The root of all this is where love, the love of God is not proportional. And it all begins with twisted things in our life. The reason why sometimes we look for love in the wrong places is because we were damaged in love. Either love is withheld from us or we were not loved properly. Uh, we were abused. And so let's right now, let Jesus touch our hearts and lives. Father, we thank you, Lord. You know where we all are. You know our strengths and weaknesses. If all of us were to
to be brought up by angels in your perfect love. None of us might be where we are today. But that was not so. We came into this earth in an imperfect environment. We inherited weaknesses as well as strengths in our DNA. We were nurtured, sometimes perfectly, sometimes imperfectly. And we become what we become. But we thank you, you are the Almighty God who can undo the damage that humans have done to us, who can strengthen weaknesses that we inherit from our forefathers. For you are the Almighty God. So we ask, O God, that you touch us afresh. Let the life and the blood and the love of Jesus touch us deeply so that we can be transformed until we are the very image of Christ. Establish this, Father God, in Jesus' name, the Lord bless you, the Lord keep you, the Lord make His face shine upon you, the Lord lift up His countenance upon you and give you grace and favour. In Jesus' name, Amen. Give Jesus a good clap offering. God bless each one of you. Amen.